So I include this cartoon for a couple of reasons. Um, if we're going to talk about teaching as organizing and we're going to talk about a teacher that uh, is struggling with planning and preparation, I thought it would be a little humorous to include a cartoon with a guy that uh, is so disorganized that he can't find his organization as the key to success poster. It also touches on me personally. I've developed quite a reputation um, as having some OCD tendencies around uh, my school as a teacher and as a coach. Uh, my coworkers love to give me a hard time and, and try to mess with my head a little bit by disorganizing things or moving my calendars or, or different things like that. But um, I absolutely believe in organizing and planning and preparation. Um, I think that's one, those, those, those are some characteristics as teachers that we actually have the most control over. Um, really planning and preparation just come down to doing your due diligence and working ahead of time to, to be prepared um, and being willing to put in the time that it takes to be an effective teacher. Um, and so if a teacher's struggling in that regards, I think um, that's obviously a critical place to be struggling. It's something that we have to remedy. But at the same time, I'd be hopeful that with some work and with some time that we could help this teacher uh, and, and help him become a better instructor and educator by teaching him the proper ways to plan uh, for effective instruction. Um, and so I'm going to go over a couple things in, in this slide that I would probably share with that teacher. Um, definitely some examples and some books that would be important. And then I think it would just be uh, critical that we have the conversation and, and we go about it together to where we can help this teacher become uh, a better planner in order to become a better teacher. Um, just want to touch on briefly the importance of planning and preparation. I think obviously as teachers, uh, we all have this. Uh, for the most part, I think we understand this. That's why we're getting our masters and everything else. But apparently this teacher doesn't maybe understand the importance of it. And maybe that's why he's poor in this area. Um, so I just wanted to share with him a couple things uh, that might help motivate him to become a better uh, organizer as far as a teacher. Um, one thing that Lee Mav talks a lot about in Teach Like a Champion, which I think is a fantastic book, which I'll talk about at the end. But he talks about uh, asking yourself, why are you teaching them? material you're teaching and what's the outcome you desire. As teachers, we have to do this. And I think as teachers, we need to then share the answers to these questions with our students. I think why we do things and what the outcome is for what we're doing, I think that's important that students understand. And, and, and we can't let our students understand that unless we take the time to, to plan that ourselves and be able to answer those questions ourselves. So it's important to understand the why and the desired outcome, which I think we've all talked about a little bit with the essential learning goals and those kind of things. Um, as Danielson talks about in the book, uh, the idea that the content has to be transformed to the students, uh, to their level, um, so you can schematically work with them so they can build on their knowledge and, be, and become more aware of the content. I think obviously uh, as teachers we should have a, a pretty strong knowledge base in our content area. Now obviously that content knowledge varies from teacher to teacher and grade level to grade level like it talks about in the book. But for the most part we're pretty solid in our content area, otherwise we're maybe not the most effective instructors. But just the fact that we are solid in our content doesn't mean we're good teachers. I think the, the, the challenge for teachers is to take that content, break it down into activities, break it down into readings and exercises and discussions and different things that will then make it accessible to your students. And I think that's what Danielson talks about and I think that's a very important part of planning. Planning the questions that you'll ask, the activities that you'll do, the, the work that you require, the projects that the students will, will take part in. So that's the planning that takes place to really help that content knowledge get delivered. Um, and then this is a big one for me. I think Danielson touched on this. Lee Mob touched on it. Uh, I think most, most researchers and authors have talked about this importance. But the idea of having those outcomes be clear, have them relate to the students as far as what their goals are. Um, and I'm a big proponent of having those outcomes posted and shared. I think it's, it's wrong for teachers to keep that to ourselves. When we have specific outcomes that we want our students to achieve, we need to let our students know. The more that you share with students as far as what is expected of them, the better chance they have of, of achieving those, those expectations. And so I think it's important that as a teacher, you plan and you prepare and you, and you develop those outcomes based on state standards and local curriculum and everything else. And then you share that information in a way that your students will understand. Um, so some keys that I would say as far as instructional planning and, and preparation. Um, the first one is touched on by a lot of different people, and it's something we actually really just talked about, but beginning with the end, uh, using your state standards, using your local curriculum, whatever the case may be, develop uh, goals for what you want your students to be able to accomplish at the end. The idea of planning day by day, well, what are we going to do tomorrow, is not effective instruction. There has to be overarching goals involved, and we have, as teachers, we have to keep that in mind um, at all times. We have to have the bigger goal in mind, and so we have to begin with the end, whether that's the objective or the assessment or whatever the case may be. We need to have an idea of where we're going if we want to be able to get there. Um, 
simplicity and clarity. Uh, Mike Schmoker in his book Focus talks a lot about simplifying and clarifying and really even eliminating some things. Uh, if you look at some some of the common core state standards that are, that are, that are the newest thing as far as what we're expected to teach our students, um, some of that stuff looks like Russian to me. And so I would imagine my students might struggle to understand what some of those objectives and standards are. And so it's our job as educators to simplify and clarify those standards uh, so that our students do understand what we're expecting of them. Um, Schmoker argues, and I think I would agree, that it also includes maybe picking some essential standards and some power standards that, that are most important. Because I think we all know as teachers, uh, every, time, every time that April, May comes around and you're like, oh gosh, what did I not get to this year? Um, and I think that's a fact in education. That it's just so difficult to cover the material that we're supposed to cover. And, and as Danielson argues, it, it's better to go for, for depth than breadth. And so I would say we need to pick the key components of our class and the key standards uh, and objectives for our students and, and focus on those. Um, Danielson talks about coherence and structure and I think this is the basic, this is the crux of, of good, good instruction. You have to be able to piece things together where the, whether that's a lecture, discussion, activities, assessments, everything has to flow. Everything has to make sense together. There has to be a rhyme and a reason to what you're doing and why. Um, and I think that's really key for good teachers is to plan that accordingly. Plan your questions and even your follow-up questions so that there's a, there's a reason behind what you're doing and the students understand that. I think the quickest way to lose my middle school classroom is have them not understand why we're doing something or, or be confused about the order in which we're doing something. Uh, different activities need to build on each other. Different days and different weeks need to build on each other and things need to tie together well. Lee Mav in, in Teach Like a Champion talks about double planning. Um, don't just plan for what you're going to do, plan for what your students are going to do. I think that's, that's a missing key for some teachers. I think we plan so much uh, about how well we're going to present this information. But we need to also kind of plan what do we expect our students to do during this time. Um, uh, with that, I think the double plan idea in general, I, I, I think there are three main components of a day that teachers really need to plan well. I think everybody understands the beginning and the closure. I think you need to have a, a strong beginning, you need to have a hook, you need to have an anticipatory set, you need to introduce the content to the students and get them excited to learn, you need to tell them why uh, it is that they're doing what they're doing and where they're going. The beginning is key. Uh, closure is obviously key. This is your chance to review. This is your chance to, to produce a formative assessment in which you can check and see, you know, did the students get it or are we going to spend a little more time on this again tomorrow? Uh, but closure and the beginning are obviously keys. The other one that I would argue, and especially this maybe comes from my middle school background, but transitions. Um, how are you going to transition from, from one activity to the next or one concept to the next? Uh, being able to link those things together. In addition to that, I would argue that transitions are necessary to incorporate and to plan into your daily lesson. Um, I'm not even a block schedule teacher. We only teach for 50 minute periods in my middle school. But even that is way too much for, for students to be doing one thing for the entire day. If I have my students come in and just sit in their desk and, and do a writing activity or do a, a listen to me lecture, whatever the case may be, 50 minutes I lose their attention um, and I lose their engagement. And so I think it's important to conscientiously plan some transitions into your day. Uh, how are they going to look? What are you going to do? How are you going to break this up to keep students engaged? Uh, one that I am absolutely a huge fan of is the idea of post-it. Uh, Limov talks about that, but many other teachers obviously talk about uh, sharing the objectives and the goals. Uh, each week when my students come in on Monday morning, they see the objectives for each day all the way through Friday. They know what we're doing in class uh, each of those days. Uh, for each unit, we have essential questions that I say our students need to be able to answer um, at the end of each unit. Um, it's important that you share those goals and you share those expectations with your students. And then I jokingly quote myself here on the end with the last key for planning and preparation. But I do think flexibility is something that you can, to some degree, plan for. We all know that the best laid plans don't always work out. And so I think it's important as a teacher to have a backup plan, uh, to have an idea of, well, what am I going to do if the kids don't get it? If I give this formative assessment, um, and they just bomb it. And if I check for understanding and I clearly get some blank faces, what's my backup plan? How do I reteach? How do I re-engage uh, to get this material across to my students? So I think uh, while flexibility and just being able to adjust on the fly is maybe a personal skill, I think to some degree you can plan and prepare for it uh, if you are organized and if you do your due diligence. Um, some examples that I wanted to share. Some of these are some, some examples to my school district. I can't claim any responsibility whatsoever to them. Um, but other examples I think is something that I've done personally for me as a teacher that I, uh, that I really feel are effective. Uh, I'll kind of start at the biggest level and work my way down so you can see how I plan. Um, the first thing that I would show you is a district-wide uh, eighth grade roadmap that we have with our Common Core Math Standards. Um, we're very fortunate in my school district. We have an extremely intelligent and driven instructional facilitator in the math department. Uh, for many years, we've been working on this, these roadmaps in our, in our math curriculum, uh, basically outlining 
the different content standards that we need to get to, placing them into various quarters, as you see, basically trying to decide how we're going to cover the content that we're supposed to cover. This is that idea of simplifying and clarifying and even just organizing ahead of time a little bit. Uh, we started doing this before the Common Core standards came into effect, but even more so now it's important that we are able to break those down, uh, pick where there's, those are going to fit throughout our scope and sequence in our school district, and it's something that's extremely valuable. Now, this portion of the document is maybe less valuable to me as a teacher. Um, it just separates the various uh, standards, but it doesn't really give you much information to work with as a teacher. Where this, val this document gets really valuable uh, is down lower in the pages, where you see now we break it down into each quarter and we develop the units that we're going to use to cover these particular standards. And so you see uh, different different subunits and topics that we'll find under the units. You see the benchmarks or the standards that you're trying to cover. Um, one thing that you see over here in quarter one in probability, you see more time needed for simulations. If you look at this, what we say is this document is actually ongoing and it's and it's always changing and we have the, the right as teachers and as staff members to modify this and work on this. Um, if you look at models and strategies and resources and assessment and different things like that, um, obviously some of that stuff is missing. Um, and that's important to understand that we're still working on this document, but it is extremely valuable for me as a teacher to be able to look at this and, and use it to help me plan my year, plan my unit, and different things like that. So something like this would be uh, critical, I think, um, for a teacher that's struggling in, with planning and preparation is to have an overarching goal, have a curriculum in their hands so that they can see this on a daily or weekly basis and really know where, they, where it is they're supposed to go. Um, the next level that we take this down to then, this is district wide and we're working on this in all of our content areas. But the next thing that I do as an individual teacher is let's say I look at that, that third unit there, expressions, equations, and inequalities. Before I go to teach this unit to my students then, I break this down to myself uh, as far as what I expect, this is a, this is what I call my essentials map, um, but it's really just a concept map. Uh, Jim Knight talks a lot about this in his different books, and I'll, and I'll reference one of those later. But but it, it's trying to visualize and illustrate for my students as well as myself what it is that we're going to do in this particular unit. So you see this is unit three, uh, which you saw on the roadmap, expressions, equations, and inequalities. Up at the top of each of my roadmaps, I put my essential questions. Uh, this is what I expect my students to be able to answer at the end of this unit. This is the why. This is the, you know, what are we trying to really accomplish with this. This is the overarching objective uh, for the particular unit. And then it's broken down and it tells you what it's all about and it kind of shows you some keys that, that I'm looking for here. Uh, well, how are we going to simplify expressions or, or what are you going to do to solve equations? And, and, and then as you break it down, then it comes down to more of the why. The reason is that we're going to try to answer questions with different solutions because there's a lot of unknowns in the world and algebra has the answer. Maybe slightly cheesy on my part or even maybe just a little bit vague, but the idea is that there's a reason we're doing this, that we need to be able to find unknowns. Uh, in the world because that's what we can use algebra for and that's what algebra has been developed for. And so this kind of, uh, again, is a document that I create for myself, but it's also something that I share with my students at the beginning of the unit and we reference throughout the unit. And I say, okay, get out your essentials map. What have we done? Where are we going? What's next? Um, that It's really key, again, that I think that we share this information with our students and we make them active members of this whole process. Um, so then to break this down even further, you see as far as simplifying expressions, then let's say I'm really struggling with being organized and, and planning and preparing. And so that's maybe where I'd require a lesson plan um, where you actually have to fill this in and you have your, your different uh, standards and big ideas, your expected outcomes. This is more on a daily to weekly basis where you're really being precise about your planning as far as how you're going to do this. Um, uh, truth be told, this was something that our principal required at the beginning of the semester to work on some teachers that uh, were not quite so effective in their planning. Um, and I, that's the way I think I would use it as sort of a catch and release method. If a, a teacher like the one uh, featured in this forum is struggling, this would be one of the things that I would maybe start requiring them to do until they show that they have developed a strength for planning uh, their lessons. But so there you see the three different levels as far as how I think effective instruction can be planned um, over the course uh, of a unit or a week or a day. Um, some work cited, like I mentioned, obviously Danielson uh, is, is key. I really like the frameworks and it, there's a reason that this was domain number one. I think uh, without planning and preparation, it, it's tough to be an effective teacher regardless of the other domains. Um, some other books that I would recommend, uh, the Schmoker book, it, uh, it's pretty heavy on the literacy and reading and writing. Some teachers might be turned off by that if you're a science or math teacher, um, but I think we all know that that, that students need to be able to read and write to be successful. Um, and it does provide some good ideas as far as focusing on the standards that matter most and, and simplifying and clarifying those. Um, Teach Like a Champion, I think, is probably the best book I've seen out there for effective instruction just because it's so concrete and clear. Um, it comes with a DVD of actual teachers using actual examples, very similar to the virtual mentor site that, that we're using for this class. And then Jim Knight is one that I think you probably had to read for other master's classes like myself, but this is a terrific one that I found as far as high impact instruction that just came out a couple years ago that 
that I think is really good and, and kind of is where I got the idea for the concept maps and, and how to use those. Um, those are the keys. Those are the tips that I would talk about as far as planning and preparing if I, if I encountered this teacher that was struggling. And hopefully with that, with some, some in-depth conversations, some reading and some, some reflection, uh, we could get the problem solved. Thanks.